On March 12th of 2007, on the random board of 4chan, an anonymous user posted a .gif image. At a first glance, strangely, the .gif image wasn't animated. It was simply titled, I'm happy .gif, and showed what appeared to be a drawing of a smiley face, only with realistic looking eyes and a mouth. People who clicked on it saw the smiley face's smile slowly turn into a frown, and the eyes start to take on an angrier appearance. The smiley face would then scream loudly, loud enough to burst eardrums, and gruesome images of rapes, bomb test victims, abused fetuses, mutilated bodies, and animals being tortured would flash by quickly. After about five minutes, it would show the text, Have Nice Day and the user's computer would automatically close out of the browser and would stop working, almost as if a virus had corrupted the entire hard drive. People whose computers were infected would shortly be found in their homes afterward, skinned and mutilated, with a smiley face painted in blood on the floor next to their corpses. The founder of 4chan, Moot, would always claim that the picture never existed and that the murderers were unrelated. However, somewhere in the archives, the picture still exists. Most people who attempt to post it are usually swiftly banned by moot. So, what shall we cut off next? An ear? Your big toe, perhaps? Maybe I'll just slice out your tongue so I don't have to hear your whiny snivelling anymore. I test the restraints again as the maniac walks across the room to pick out yet another tool from his surgical kit. But there's no way I can escape. He hums to himself as he lightly runs his fingers along each torture device, taking his time to make his selection. Ah, the scalpel. Oh, we can have so much good fun with this one. <laughs> he wraps his hand around my throat. It feels like he's crushing my trachea. Every muscle in my body tenses as he sticks the instrument into my eye. The pain is incredible and indescribable. He laughs out loud to himself like some kind of supervillain as he twists and turns the pointed object and scrambles the inside of my socket. After what feels like minutes, he pulls the thing out from my face, and a mangled cluster of what used to be an eyeball dangles down my cheek. He laughs again. I hope you enjoyed that, friend. Because we're going to be at it. All. Night. Long. All night long. Good. He better. After all, it is what I paid him for. Sometime, during the night of August 16th, 1952, the small town of Ashley, Kansas, ceased to exist. At 3.28 a.m. on August 17th, 1952, a magnitude 7.9 earthquake was measured by the United States Geological Survey. The earthquake itself was felt throughout the state and most of the Midwest. The epicenter was determined to be directly underneath Ashley, Kansas. When state law enforcement arrived at what should have been the outskirts of the farming community, they found a smoldering, burning fissure in the earth, measuring 1,000 yards in length and approximately 500 yards in width. Though the depth 
of the fissure was never determined by geologists. After 12 days, the statewide and local search for the missing 679 residents of Ashley, Kansas was called off by the Kansas state government at 9.15 p.m. on the night of August 29, 1952. All 679 residents were assumed to be dead. At 2.27 a.m. on August 30, 1952, a magnitude 7.5 earthquake was measured by the United States Geological Survey. The epicenter was situated under what used to be the location of Ashley, Kansas. When state law enforcement investigated at 5.32 a.m., they reported that the mysterious fissure in the earth had closed. In the eight days leading up to the disappearance of the town and its 679 residents, bizarre and unexplainable events were reported by dozens of residents in Ashley and law enforcement from the surrounding area as well. On the evening of August 8, 1952, at 7.13 p.m., a resident by the name of Gabriel Jonathan reported a strange sight in the skies above Ashley. The town itself, having no official branch of law enforcement, called into the police station of the neighboring town of Hayes. Gabriel reported what appeared to be a small black opening in the sky. Within the next 15 minutes, the Hayes police station became overwhelmed with dozens of phone calls, all reporting the same phenomenon. This phenomenon was never reported by any neighboring communities, however. A decision was made to send a trooper to Ashley to investigate the matter the following morning. At 7.54 a.m. on the morning of August 9, 1952, Hayes Police Officer Alan Mace radioed the Hayes Police Station. He reported that despite following the one-way road leading into Ashley, he had become lost. According to his report, the road continued along its normal path, but somehow ended up back in Hayes. Officer Mace went on to add that the road never curved or bent in any direction. At 9.15 a.m., seven of the town's ten police cars were sent to investigate the situation, and all members of the team came to the same conclusion. The only road leading into Ashley stopped leading into Ashley, but instead led back to Hayes. Phone calls continued to pour into the Hayes police station, all reporting that the black opening in the sky continued to grow in size. All callers were advised to remain inside and to not travel outside unless absolutely deemed necessary. At 8.17 p.m., Mrs. Elaine Cantor reported her neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Milton, and their two children, Jeffrey and Brooke, missing. According to Mrs. Cantor's phone call, the Miltons attempted to leave town in their family car earlier in the evening. They never returned. Law enforcement officials from Hayes never reported the car or any individuals coming up the one-way road. At 7.38 a.m. on the morning of August 10, 1952, phone calls from Ashley into the Hayes Police Station reported that the town was in total darkness. The sun had never risen. At 10.15 a.m., at the request of Hayes law enforcement, a helicopter from Topeka, Kansas, flew over the region in which Ashley, Kansas stood. Reports came back that the town was never observed from the air. At 12.43 p.m. on the afternoon of August 11, 1952, Mrs. Phoebe Danieleski called in to the Hayes Police Station. She reported that her daughter Erica had begun to have conversations with her father, who died three years prior in a drunk driving accident. To add to her concern, Mrs. Danieleski reported that Erica was attempting to go outside into the dark to, quote, join them. Over the course of the next 12 hours, a reported 329 phone calls were placed into the Hayes Police Station, all describing similar phenomenon with the other children of the town. The following morning of August 12, 1952, the situation became dire. During the middle of the night, all 217 children of Ashley, Kansas, disappeared. A reported 421 phone calls were placed into the Hayes Police Department. Unable to be of any useful assistance, Hayes Law Enforcement instructed all callers to remain inside and to avoid any and all attempts at finding the missing children. At 5.19 p.m. on the evening of August 13, 1952, Ashley elderly man Scott Luntz reported a growing distant fire to the south. According to his description, the fire seemed to turn the distant black into bright red and orange that seemed to extend high into the skies above. Throughout the rest of the day, calls continued in, stating that the fire, in addition to moving north, 
now seemed to come out of the blackened sky. No fire was ever witnessed by any of the neighboring communities or law enforcement officials. The reports continued until 12.09 a.m. on the morning of August 14, 1952. The last phone call, placed by a Mr. Benjamin Endicott, reported that the fire in the south had grown so intense that it began to appear as daytime over the town. The phone call ended abruptly. From the phone call placed by Benjamin Sherman Endicott to the Hayes Police Department. Just hold on. Uh, oh, wait, wait. Yeah, 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 I see something. It, it, it's to the south. It looks like... The next phone call wouldn't be placed until the following evening. The following is the entire transcript of the final phone call to be received by the Hayes Police Department out of the town of Ashley, Kansas. It was placed at 9.46 p.m. on the evening of August 15, 1952. In this recorded phone call, the officer on duty is Officer Peter Welsh. The caller has been identified as Miss April Foster. Hayes Police Department. Hello? Y yes y Yes, hello? Ma'am, who am I speaking with? My name is a April. A April Foster. <laughs> Please, sir. Please, sir, help me. What's happening, ma'am? Last night. Last night they came back. Ma'am. Ma'am, I'm going to need you to- LAST NIGHT THEY CAME BACK! Ma'am, I'm, I'm going to need you to calm down and speak clearly. What happened? Who came back? Everyone. Everyone? They all came. In the fire. What do you mean, everyone? M my son, I... I saw my son last night. He was walking, he was... He was walking down the street. He was, he was burned. Jesus Christ, he was burned. Ma'am, I... He, he... He died last year. I, I raised him since he was... Since he was a baby. It was just me and him. I told him to watch for cars when he rode his bike, but he never wanted to listen. Ma'am, what you're saying isn't making any sense. You said everyone came back. Are you fucking listening to me? Everyone! Everyone came back. Everyone who died or went missing, they are back. And they're looking for us. He... He said, Mommy, I'm okay now, see? I can walk again. Where are you, Mommy? I want to see you, Mommy. Where are you now? Are you safe? Of course I am. I I'm hiding. Like everyone else, we saw them coming to the fields and... Oh God, some people opened their doors for them. God, the screaming. I don't know what happened to them, but their houses caught fire and... And they caved in. I have my curtains drawn. I'm hiding in the closet right now and... Ma'am, is everything all right? Are you okay? Ma'am. Something just came in. Ma'am, just stay as quiet as you can. Don't make a sound. Mommy? Mommy? He came inside. Stay absolutely still. Do not... Mommy. Mommy. Where are you hiding? Stay quiet. Ma'am? Ma'am! The following morning, at 6.55 a.m., the law enforcement officials of the Hayes Police Department arrived at the location of Ashley, Kansas. A smoldering, 
burning fissure in the earth was all that remained. Into our town, the hangman came, smelling of gold and blood, and flame, and he paced our bricks with a diffident air, and built his frame on the courthouse square. The scaffold stood by the courthouse side, only as wide as the door was wide, a frame as tall, or little more, than the capping sill, of the courthouse door. And we wondered. Whenever we had the time, who the criminal, and what the crime, that hangman judged with the yellow twist of knotted hemp in his busy fist, and innocent though we were with dread, we passed those eyes of buckshot lead till one cried, "Hangman, who is he for whom you raise the gallows tree?" Then a twinkle grew in the buckshot eye, and he gave us a riddle instead of reply. He who serves me best. Said he, "Shall earn the rope on the gallows tree." And he stepped down and laid his hand on a man who came from another land, and we breathed again for another's grief. At the hangman's hand was our relief, and the gallows frame on the courthouse lawn by tomorrow's sun would be struck and gone. So we gave him way, and no one spoke, out of respect for his hangman's cloak. The next day's sun looked mildly down on roof and street in our quiet town, and stark and black in the morning air, the gallows tree on the courthouse square, and the hangman stood at his usual stand with the yellow hemp in his busy hand, with his buckshot eye and his jaw like a pike, and his air so knowing and businesslike, and we cried, "Hangman, have you not done yesterday with the alien one?" And then we fell silent and stood amazed. Oh, not for him! Twas the gallows raised. He laughed a laugh as he looked at us. Did you think I'd gone to all this fuss to hang one man? That's a thing I do, to stretch the rope when the rope is new. Then one cried, "Murderer!" One cried, "Shame!" And into our midst, the hangman came, to that man's place. Do you hold? Said he, with him that was meant for the gallows tree. And he laid his hand on that one's arm, and we shrank back in quick alarm, and we gave him way, and no one spoke, out of fear of his hangman's cloak. That night we saw with dread surprise the hangman's scaffold had grown in size, fed by the blood beneath the shoot, the gallows tree had taken root, now as wide or a little more than the steps that led to the courthouse door, as tall as the writing, or nearly as tall, halfway up on the courthouse wall. The third he took, we had all heard tell, was an usurer and infidel. And what said the hangman? Have you to do with the gallows bound and he a Jew? And we cried out, Is this one he who has served you well and faithfully? The hangman smiled. It's a clever scheme to try the strength of the gallows beam. The fourth man's dark, accusing song had scratched out comfort hard and long. And what concern he gave us back? Have you for the doomed, the doomed in black, the fifth, the sixth? And we cried again, Hangman, Hangman, is this the man? It's a trick, he said, that we hangmen know, for easing the trap when the trap springs slow. And so we ceased and asked no more, as the hangman tallied his bloody score. And sun by sun, and night by night, the gallows grew to monstrous height. The wings of the scaffold opened wide, till they covered the square from side to side. And the monster crossbeam, looking down, cast its shadow across the town. Then through the town the hangman came and called in the empty streets my name. And I looked at the gallows soaring tall and thought, there is no one left at all for hanging. And so he calls to me. To surely help pull down the gallows tree, and I went out with right good hope to the hangman's tree, and the hangman's rope. He smiled at me as I came down to the courthouse square through the silent town, and supple and stretched in his busy hand was the yellow twist of the hempen strand, and he whistled his tune as he tried the trap, 
and it sprang down with a ready snap. And then with a smile of awful command, he laid his hand upon my hand. You tricked me, hangman, I shouted then, that your scaffold was built for other men, and I no henchman of yours, I cried. You lied to me, hangman, foully you lied. Then a twinkle grew in the buckshot eye. Lied to you, tricked you, he said. <laughs> Not I. For I answered straight, and I told you true. The scaffold was raised for none but you. For who has served me more faithfully than you? With your coward's hope, said he. And where are the others that might have stood, side by your side, in the common good? Dead, I whispered, and amiably. Murdered, the hangman corrected me. First the alien, and then the Jew. I did no more than you let me do. Beneath the beam that blocked the sky, none had stood so alone as I, and the hangman strapped me, and no voice there cried, Stay for me in the empty square. Well, we've all been there. You have just gone to a certain place, at a certain time, on a certain date, done a special thing, and the thing that you suspected would happen had just fucking happened. Not to mention the fact that you've just seen whatever the fuck it is that lives in your mirror, been told in detail how you're going to die, and the highly demonic and invincible thing that you summoned is now heading towards you. Also, your family's all dead, your friends are all missing, and you're being framed by somebody with access to your bedroom. What the fuck do you do now, sweet protagonist? Well, you've come to the right place to find out. These are the simple rules one must follow in order to firstly not become the victim of creepypasta, and furthermore, to come out kicking if the worst does happen. With the help of this guide, you too can be merely a catatonic traumatized wreck, as opposed to the guy currently being worn as a coat by some dude who roams a lot. So just keep these simple rules in mind, and you might just survive. Rule number one. Mirrors and darkness don't mix. Rule number two. Actually, mirrors are a general no in the creepypasta world. There is nothing more sinister. Rule number three. There is zero chance of survival if you look at the thing that no one else can see or answer its question incorrectly. Rule number four. If you are alone at night in a creepy mental institution, take some time to consider what the fuck you're doing there, and then, if it is appropriate to do so, leave. Rule number five. Avoid going to places where everyone else who went there never came back or died inexplicably. Rule number six. If someone stops your vehicle at night and asks to come with you, it would probably be in your best interest to politely decline. Rule number seven. Killing is the last method of survival. Use it sparingly, but without fear. Rule number eight. Who was phone is always a good thing to ponder. Also, who the hell answers a phone while having sex with a dead person's sexy daughter? A creepy rapist. That's who. Rule number nine. Get a simple 38 revolver, load it with two silver bullets, and if you really feel that there is no chance to come out alive of a situation, take one shot at whatever it is that is threatening you, and if this doesn't work, you still have the last shot to become a hero with. Rule number 10. Area 51 is simply too well guarded to let you get in. Or to let any alien out. Rule number 11. When going to a hotel, try to steer clear of unauthorized areas. If you couldn't resist, but you saw a red thing, take some time to consider the price range and motel standards on your next visit. You ever stayed at a haunted Hilton? Didn't think so. Rule number 12. When booking your hotel stay, TripAdvisor can be an invaluable tool in deeming whether your choice is the scene of a multiple murder, full of dead people, or built on the mouth of hell. Local newspapers can also be helpful. Rule number 13. Invoking demons, speaking weird languages, and performing rituals of any kind is considered dangerous. Refrain from doing that, especially around abandoned warehouses, churches, psychiatric institutions, the woods, and your house in front of a mirror at night. Rule number 14. When going to a new area, environmental understanding is a key to survival. Ask around for cursed places, legends, dangers, and other details. Listen to the local people's advice, and don't be afraid to ask if you're unsure of which attacks slash disappearances are paranormal and which are not. Rule number 15. Always have a Bible next to your bed. It provides average reading material, proof of beliefs, and is a really heavy and effective object to throw at enemies. Rule number 16. Don't count on holy water. Get a sturdy vial of sulfuric acid and let a priest consecrate it. Rule number 17. 
Japanese priests cleanse rooms by waving katana thorns around. Their ritual is 100% effective on corporeal forms. Rule number 18. If you find 666 messages on your phone, mailbox, email, etc., then consider changing said service provider. Also, don't bother listening to or reading the messages. It's spam. Extra-dimensional, possibly, but spam nonetheless. Rule number 19. Old pharmaceutical companies cannot help you unless you specifically need blood of the innocent, snake oil, or radioactive syrup, which is never. Rule number 20. If you need to sign it in blood, then you do not need to sign it. All mainstream governing bodies will accept contracts signed in ink. Bear this in mind if offered deals that seem too good to be true, because those deals are probably too good to be true. Rule number 21. Lighthouses are dangerous. Avoid them at all costs. If you work at a lighthouse, consider a career in insurance sales or veterinary care. You ever read The Skeleton Key? Rule number 22. There is simply no reason to listen to music that causes suicidal tendencies. Rule number 23. Or to watch films that have had strange life disastrous consequences. Rule number 24. If you like to plan ahead and have some money, buy your auntie and uncle a house in Bel Air. Nothing can harm you there, no matter how scared your mother is. Rule number 25. Secret, secluded, untouched places in old buildings are left untouched for a reason. Pioneers never say die, but in fact do have an unusually high mortality rate. Rule number 26. Before you start swimming in the ice-cold waters of a murky lake at the center of a dark forest at midnight, ask yourself this. Do you really want to travel to an ancient and terrifying city? If the answer is no, then stay at home instead and watch whatever quality programming is available on Cinemax, which means boobs. Rule number 27. On your 33rd birthday, try celebrating in a well-lit house with a company of others. Rule number 28. Refrain from using the one true name for anything, because there is probably good reason as to why people gave it a nickname. Rule number 29. Watching TV static for long periods of time may be hazardous to your health. Try satellite TV or Freeview to combat this problem. Netflix and internet streaming are also effective. Rule number 30. Get a cat. Those furry little hairballs seem to perceive unnatural phenomenon better than us, and if desperate, simply throw it at whatever is about to get you. Rule number 31. Safety in numbers. If you're getting a bit too freaked out, grab a few friends, any and all firearms, and avoid the area in question. Rule number 32. Cemeteries are bad places, especially in foggy conditions and on Halloween and at midnight. Rule number 33. Try not to close your eyes. Ever. If you must do so, do so only briefly. If something has moved from its original location in the time that it has taken you to blink, then it is recommended that you do not blink again until you have dealt with said object. Fire is presumably the best method. Rule number 34. If you ever find an unmarked tape which contains the file extension .avi, even if it is your favorite kid show, do not, under any circumstances, watch the tape. Now if the extension's .mts, then that's a different matter altogether, but we'll get to that. Rule number 35. If you hear chanting, run until you are out of earshot of said chanting. Rule number 36. If you are too old to play with dolls, then you don't need to be anywhere near one of those creepy little fuckers. There's just no reason to have them. Rule number 37. Legends can offer valuable insight of where not to go camping with friends. Bear this in mind when scheduling trips. Rule number 38. When babysitting, ascertain the family's tastes and preferences to avoid being killed by poorly selected statues. Rule number 39. Even if you are certain that running will not save you, it is always best to try. Rule number 40. If you go to buy a used video game, whether it's at a GameStop or a garage sale, never, ever buy one with a weird looking cartridge. This includes strange colors and ripped off labels with titles written in marker. The latter tends to happen more often than not. And for the daring, don't just buy said game to become famous. Your chances of becoming an internet celebrity because of it can only work if you know how to program. You should also be highly suspicious of games priced too cheaply and of bootlegs. Rule number 41. If you decide to buy the used game anyway, rip that son of a bitch out of your console the minute it starts acting funny and take a hammer to it. Rule number 42. If you ever see a strangely new looking doorway with a strange face on it on a building that you swore you didn't see at first, and the building just so happens to be an old chateau, don't fucking open it. Rule number 43. It's probably best to refrain from looking up on Google the phrase, Huskies with grins. You'll just end up having to spread the word. <laughs> Rule number 44. Never allow someone to take a picture of you with an outdated camera. If it is too late, then your only bet is to gamble with death, or just chop him in a photo. That works too. Rule number 45. Don't play with dolls if they come with a needle or a defect. 
especially a defect. Rule number 46, burn Ouija boards. But be sure to have one of those car fresheners handy. The real reason why spirits get so pissed off is because of that foul aroma that it produces whenever it's burned. Rule number 47, never confront animated puppets physically. Subdue them with spells or they'll come back with minions or in a real physical body. Rule number 48, if you find yourself unable to escape, dancing may ward off the entity. Doing the hokey pokey is known to ward off curious monsters, but you might have to do the moonwalk to deal with zombies. Rule number 49, if you're checking your computer for viruses and you go too deep into System 32, refrain from clicking on any .avi files. If you do not heed this warning, creepy videos on you, dude. Rule number 50. If you see old tapes containing the words happy and or appy, pretend you never saw them. Just go on with your life. It'll just end up invoking some whacked out, coked up director of an old children's show and you'll wind up having to pull some things for the ride shit to kill him. Rule number 51. If you buy a used camcorder and find the previous owner left one of their tapes inside, refrain from watching that tape no matter how tempting it may be to you. Rule number 52. Be careful when buying an old secondhand TV. Rule number 53. If you see a guy with both an incredibly large smile and black and white eyes, extricate yourself from the premises post haste. Rule number 54. Don't go to a friend's house to bake cupcakes if they have random spurts of insanity. Rule number 55. Phone companies with low coverage are best avoided. Rule number 56. .exe files with strange names are not safe. Do not open them. Rule number 57. For the love of Neptune, turn off your fucking faucet when you're done with it. Rule number 58. If you are told to not look behind you, it's better to do so, unless you're against a wall. Rule number 59. Also, do not listen to anybody who tells you to go to sleep. It's better to run away. Rule number 60. If you see a tall man with tentacles, run. Rule number 61. Don't enter strange websites. Rule number 62. Don't enter strange places. Rule number 63. Not even strange videos. Rule number 64. If a woman who covers her mouth asks you if she's beautiful, tell her she's average. It'll prevent her from slicing open your mouth. Rule number 65. No good can ever come from owning a shiny Pokemon. Rule number 66. If you're an intern at a cartoon studio and you just happen to be reviewing a new episode, make sure that the episode is safe for work before viewing that shit. Rule number 67. Don't be so excited when being asked to look behind you, but don't take forever. No reason to keep certain death waiting after all. Rule number 68. Weird shit in Europe won't hurt you in the United States. Leave that to creeps, scarecrow, and the creepy dark. Rule number 69. Weird shit in the United States won't hurt you in Europe. Damn. Rule number 70. Should you break rule 54, there is always a chance of rescue. Rule number 71. If your brother is tired of noise, or if your close friend has a brother like that, refrain from going into his basement unless you want to be tortured, raped, and killed. Especially raped. Isn't that right, MCP? <laughs> rule number 72. If you buy a memory card and it has saved data on it, delete all of the saves. Rule number 73. If you get a drawing of Sonic on a disc and the only file on that disc is a .exe file named Sonic, don't play it. Destroy it or a demonic being that looks like a Sonic plushie might kill you. If he chooses not to, then he'll scar you for life. Rule number 74. If you see what appears to be a 12-year-old kid with black shorts, a gray bloody shirt, red shades, dark gray skin, and a maniac grin, do not, under any circumstances, piss him off. Unless you're werepire or just brave. Rule number 75. Neighbors may have a darker side. If they do things that seem off for them, act normal. Rule number 76. In addition to rule 77, if you hear foreign voices from your body, that means that you have been body jacked. Rule number 77. If you are an adult and notice that you are being stalked by a guy with black suit, long arms, and no face, reach for the nearest child and throw him slash her at him, then run like hell. Rule number 78. If you are a child in this same situation, run like hell before said adult uses you to satisfy aforementioned beings craving hunger. If you do not manage to escape before the adult snags you, try bargaining with the Slender Man that the adult has more delicious flesh. Rule number 79. The Slender Man, said monster descriptive in the last two tips, feeds on paranoia. If you simply remember Slender Man only wants a hug, then he won't go after you. But if Slender Man does stalk you, run, man! Rule number 80. If all else fails, give Slender Man $20 and he should leave you alone. Rule number 81. If you see someone crawling around, it's more likely to be something, and you don't want more information about it. That I can assure you of. Rule number 82. If you are a police officer, state trooper, FBI agent, or any person of authority and you have two days left until retirement, if you happen to notice 
anything suspicious or dangerous to health, get the fuck out of there immediately. Rule number 83. If you are being chased by any creepypasta and you feel that you are 100% out of options, attempt to run to wherever Stephen King is doing his next book signing. Your killer will be far too interested in trying to get an autograph to remember what they were doing in the first place. If Stephen King's not in your general vicinity at the time, R.L. Stein is also acceptable. Rule number 84. If you are a creepypasta reader and feel like things are getting a little too real, take a break. Rule number 85. If you find a magic stick that lets you draw living creatures, don't draw yourself. You may be quite surprised how pissed off your creations can be at you. Rule number 86. If you wake up in the middle of the woods after having fallen asleep listening to your own heartbeat, take notice that someone probably put you there. But, but, but don't call the police! Publish a book out of it and get a movie deal instead. Rule number 87. If you're being offered an orange by a demon, either don't take it or follow the steps from Rule 89. Rule 88. On the third day of the third month of every 33rd year, seal up all the openings to your house unless you want to be eaten by an evil mist. Rule number 89. If you notice that you are being stalked by a screaming child in a skull mask, don't always assume that the kid is evil. Just be sure to save the bunch of crunch should you have any. Rule number 90. When reminiscing about your favorite kid's show on a message board, take a moment to consider if the episode where all the characters scream their lungs out was real or not. Also take a moment to consider if the entire show was real or not. Rule number 91. When looking through mysterious blood-soaked pictures left in your mailbox, make sure that all of your windows and doors are already locked. Rule number 92. Remember, snowmen have feelings too. Rule number 93. Stitch is naked. Covering him with a towel will cause him to die. Do so. Rule number 94. If your friend disturbingly edits tapes, it's probably a good idea to never try to see him again. Rule number 95. If you keep finding broken glass in your home, check to see if the shards match the colors of the glass object that was broken. And if they don't, run. Rule number 96. If Jeff the Killer shows up in your bedroom unarmed and invites you to follow him to his home, for God's sake, don't do it. Rule number 97. Should you notice that your friend has suddenly developed a personality that's a mix between Heath Ledger's Joker and Beetlejuice, he or she is most likely inhabited, and it would be best to keep clear of this person until they return to their normal boring-as-fuck personality. Rule number 98. If you encounter a small creature that looks like a mutant forearm baby with Jeff the Killer's face, don't listen to it. Not even if it offers you gold. Rule number 99. If you are still using Windows XP and you use it every day with internet, sticking with it is a pretty stupid decision. And if support means more doors opening for viruses, and even more doors opening for crazy shit. And to make an even 100, rule 100, stay far, far away from abandoned amusement parks. Rule 101, if your son starts talking about some sort of doll from any game, do not play the fucking game. Take the gaming system and play baseball with it. Rule 102, if you do play the game and later you hear any tapping at any place in your home, tell your child to lock their door and jump from a window. It is wise to then light the house on fire and jump from the window with your spouse. Rule number 104. Always think twice before doing something stupid or doing something that you might regret. Rule number 105. If you come across a pro wrestling DVD that you haven't heard of, it was likely never released for a reason. Rule 106. If you are browsing the internet and a colorful pop-up that says you win, you lose, or you die appears, for God's sake do not click on it. Rule number 107, if a magic 8-ball gives you anything but yes, no, or maybe, destroy it. Rule number 108, do not go to any halfway house or mental institution that you can get yourself into in any city in any country unless your name happens to be Legion. Rule 109, if you do end up in any halfway house or mental institution that you can get yourself into in any state in any country, do not talk to the receptionist at the front desk. Instead, read a magazine, pamphlet, or any source of reading material on one of the tables in the waiting area, unless your name is Legion. Rule 110, if you do talk to said receptionist at the front desk of the halfway house or mental institution in any city or any state, do not ask for anyone whose name starts with the holder of, unless your name is legion. Rule 111, do not collect all 538 objects. There is a reason why they must never come together. Unless your name is legion. Rule 112, if you find a bag with dozens of tapes inside of it, just leave it alone. Pretend you never saw it. It might be some kid that you punched in the face a while ago and is now out to kill everyone. Rule 113, there are some parts of YouTube that you should not be in. <laughs> Rule 114, don't kill anyone because you made a page on a website and an admin or someone deleted it. Just don't. 
should probably go read a book or something. Rule 115. If you buy used wireless headphones off of the internet, rip those bitches off of your head as soon as you hear static and or voices. Rule 116. If you attempt to bypass a level in an extremely hard typing game, you might find yourself trying to kidnap children whilst wearing a chef hat. Rule 117. In addition to Rule 117, there is probably a reason why the level was so damn hard in the first place. Rule 118. If you go camping in the woods and find a cabin, leave it alone. You've watched the movies. Rule 119. Everyone is scared of something. If you're not scared of anything, well, then you're a liar. Rule 120. When playing Minecraft, do not set render distance to tiny. Rule 121. If you do set your render distance to tiny and you can see a mob that looks like Steve in the distance, set render distance to full. Rule 122. If said mob is still sighted, delete the game. Rule 123. If said mob, known as Herobrine, is in every game, delete Minecraft. Rule 124. If you are in your bedroom at night and you wake to see a feeble-looking gray humanoid at the end of your bed, do not hesitate in throwing your covers over it and trying to punch it and punch it and punch it to death. Maybe put that Bible that was mentioned earlier to good use. Rule 125. If previously mentioned creature escapes one's grasp, it will stalk you and maul you. So if sighted again, run. Rule 126. Monsters still bleed. If forced to fight one, don't think that all hope is lost. Rule 127. Better safe than sorry. If you do kill whatever it is that attacked you, don't think that you're safe yet. Shoot or stab it in every vital organ that you can think of and sever limbs. Burning the corpse and or putting it through a meat grinder helps too. Rule 128. If a banshee is screaming the living shit out of you, then that is the only sign that you're going to die a slow and painful death. Rule 129. If you have a Yu-Gi-Oh! slash Pokemon card that is a very ominous force, either creates death or magic that you never imagined, either burn the card or cut it to pieces with scissors. Abandoning it, example taking it to the trash, would only simply be making you its next victim. Rule number 130. Demonic or spiritual forces can enter any object slash person with ease and can be kept out of the object by letting a priest, or a group of priests, do an exorcism as long as you or any members of your family are not the cause of it. Rule 131. Seek a fortune teller if you happen to have a spiritual experience that would affect your future. Rule 132. Rap Rat is not a song artist. In fact, just stay away from everything that concerns him. Rule 133. Slender Man does not always kill out of hunger or boredom. If he is stalking you, ask yourself if your death would benefit the rest of humanity. If it will, then just throw in the towel because he is coming. Don't believe me? Why don't you go and ask all those Nazi soldiers found impaled on the trees? <laughs> Rule 134. Hide and seek is an evil game. Rule 135. Before you consider those horrible figments of your deranged imagination your friends, take a good look at their face. If they have yellow eyes or are impossibly deformed, take as many pills as your local psychiatrist is willing to give you, which I hear in these days is quite a few. Rule 136. If you suspect that any mortal armless monster wants to put a foot through your stomach, run. Rule 137. If your walls bleed phrases that make no sense, try reading them backwards. Rule 138. If your walls start bleeding in the first place, it's best to burn the house down. Rule 139. If that one wall is miraculously unburned, run! Rule 140. Get in shape. Because the only thing that you can really do to evade the majority of creepypastas is to run. Rule 141. If you are paraplegic, make like Happy Wheels and fashion some rockets onto that damn chair. Rule 142. If any kind of man or beast appears in your room in the middle of the night, do not hesitate to stab it and stab it and stab it. Rule 143. If you have no other weapons, put that Bible I told you next to your bed to good use. Rule 144. The creepypastas that become famous can't be forced. They just happen. If you are deliberately putting yourself in danger against powerful, extremely bloodthirsty beings such as you can write a non-profit story to put up on a wiki web page, then it may be time to come to the fact that you are a complete fucking asshat! So, follow these simple rules and little or massive harm may befall you. Either way, the important thing is to make sure that your tale is told, copied, and pasted repeatedly. Forever yours, Management.